On June 14, 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin got separated from his family on a camping trip and disappeared. They were camping in Spence Field along the Appalachian Trail inside the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. After realizing that Dennis was gone, the family split up and searched the area but came up with nothing. Not long after Dennis went missing, a storm dumped almost three inches of rain on the Smoky Mountains in a matter of hours. The trails flooded and turned to rivers of mud and likely washed away any footprints that may have been left by Dennis. He had wandered away with nothing but the clothing on his back and the shoes on his feet. High winds would drown out the calls for Dennis along with any chance at hearing an answer. The next morning, park rangers began assembling a search crew. Hundreds would volunteer making this the largest search party in the park's history. With nearly 1,500 searchers, consisting of park rangers and FBI agents to Boy Scouts and Green Berets, they would calm a 60 square mile stretch of the park. However, they would come away empty handed. They would find a set of footprints in the area, but at the time they were determined by park officials to have been left by a Boy Scout who was helping with the search. However, retired park ranger Dwight McCarter thinks they were likely Dennis Martin's because the footprints indicated one of the child's feet was barefoot and the other foot was wearing tennis shoes. The footprints led to a stream and disappeared. McCarter would say the tracks were not part of the search group because none of the Boy Scouts were searching while barefoot. A sock and shoe were also found. By June 22nd, 56 square miles of ground had been covered and still no signs of Dennis Martin. On June 24th, searchers came across a young boy wearing a red t-shirt and green shorts. The same color of shirt and shorts Dennis had been wearing when he vanished, walking the perimeter road of the Cades Cove campground. It turned out the boy's name was Michael Devlin and he was camping in the area with his parents. The parents agreed to change the boy's shirt to avoid any further confusion. On June 25th, his family broke camp and returned home to Knoxville without their child, Dennis Martin, and let searchers continue searching the park. More than a thousand searchers would continue to look for Dennis until June 26th. The search would be cut back and by June 29th, it was completely abandoned after a final search that day. On September 14, 1969, the search would be officially closed down with Dennis Martin still missing. The failed search for Dennis became a textbook example across the world of how not to search for a missing person. Park officials now acknowledge there were way too many over-eager volunteers, too many inexperienced eyes, and too many careless feet. The search was unorganized and chaotic. At one point, one volunteer accidentally shot himself in the leg. Another would break their arm after falling off a bridge. Some searchers had never even set foot in the park before, and others didn't even know how to use a compass. The most probable theory is that Dennis became lost and perished from exposure or some other cause during his first night lost in the park. Another theory is he may have been attacked by a hungry bear or feral pig and carried off. There's another interesting theory that Dennis was abducted and taken out of the park. On the afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Harold Key and his family, who were tourists in the park, heard an enormous sickening scream and shortly after witnessed a hairy looking man running up the trail with something slung over his shoulder. FBI and park rangers would say there was little evidence to suggest this was Martin since the family was about five miles away from what they saw and that it occurred after Dennis went missing. The family, however, said the object slung over the man's shoulder in the woods was highly visible red, which was the same color as the shirt Dennis was wearing when he went missing. Dennis's father was a big proponent of this last theory and would even offer a $5,000 reward for information, which would be around $35,000 today. Psychics over the years, including Jean Dixon, would offer clues, but nothing has been found. The biggest lead would be from a ginseng hunter who claimed to have discovered the scattered skeletal remains of a small child in Big Hollow, Tremont, which is around 16 miles from Cades Cove. Due to the hunting of ginseng being illegal in the park, he would keep this information secret until 1985. After he informed officials, they did a search of the area but turned up nothing. Due to how unsuccessful the search for Dennis Martin was, the National Park Service reviewed and amended their policy on how to search for missing people. As of today, Dennis Martin has never been found and this case remains unsolved. George Owens, a resident of Nolensville, Tennessee, was last seen July 22, 1985 by a clerk at a market in Perry County, Tennessee. He would buy ice cream and cigars and tell the clerk that he was looking for his wife of 60 years. The clerk tried to help him, but George's wife was more than 75 miles away waiting for him to pick her up from a bus station in downtown Nashville. When the clerk couldn't help him, George walked out of the market and would vanish forever. The only trace left was his pristine 1972 green Dodge Dart left on a wooded hill in Perry County. George Owens was a retired custodian from the disinfectant maker Nashville Products Company and was an associate pastor at the New Hope Baptist Church in Nashville. 
George was a family man and church leader and according to his family, not the type to disappear without a trace. He was described as well known and well liked by the people in his church. He had been married to his high school sweetheart, Eileen, for more than 60 years when the 79-year-old man vanished. She described their relationship as good. I called him honey and he called me Al, she said. They never had any children but filled their days with the word of the Lord, doing for others, and doing for themselves together. The last time Eileen Owens talked to her husband was Sunday afternoon on July 21st, 1985. The couple was making plans for him to pick her up at a bus station in downtown Nashville after she had traveled home from visiting relatives in Cleveland, Ohio. George Owens was spotted by friends that afternoon driving north on Nolansville Road. Witnesses assumed he was heading to the bus stop a day early to pick up Eileen, but when her bus arrived around 6.30 Monday morning, George was nowhere to be found. After an hour, she assumed he overslept and called George's brother Alfred for a ride. Around 9 or 10 a.m. down in Maury County, Tennessee, George was seen by Larry Potts, owner of Potts Garage in Santa Fe, Tennessee. He was tasked with replacing a flat on the Dodge Dart. He acted a little confused at first, Potts told the Tennessean, like he didn't know what he wanted, but then he told me he wanted to buy a new tire. Potts replaced the flat, George paid and went on his way. Potts said he headed north on Highway 7 towards Williamson County, adding he didn't seem disoriented when he left. George was about 40 miles from his home in Nolansville and 50 miles from the bus station. Eileen got home around 11 a.m. and immediately knew something wasn't right. When I saw that his car wasn't there, I got this funny feeling, Eileen told the Tennessean in 1987. When George didn't come home on Monday night, Eileen called the police to report him missing. Investigators searched the woods, distributed missing person flyers, and offered a $1,000 reward. On Saturday, July 27, 1985, six days after he was reported missing, George's car was found more than 100 miles from Nolansville. The car was located near Lobelville in Perry County with a dead battery. The keys were in the ignition, but there was no sign of George except for his cane and suit jacket in the back seat. There were also no signs of foul play or a struggle. A deputy from Perry County said it would be difficult for the car to make it there because the country road was rocky and rough. One of the oddest clues found was the piles of brush and tree limbs found around and in the Dodge Dart. There was also a pack of matches left on the dash suggesting someone might have wanted to burn the car. For two weeks, search parties combed the woods along the remote ridge line but found nothing. A local TV news station did a story on his disappearance, which turned up several reported sightings including Potts' tire replacement and the clerk from Lobelville. It would also be discovered that the mechanic who fixed his tire mistakenly gave George directions to Lobelville instead of Nolansville. There was one report that George was seen at a market in Lobelville on July 23, 1985. He reportedly bought ice cream and cigars. The clerk said George told her he was looking for his wife, so she called the local clinic to see if the woman was there. When his wife wasn't found, he left. This would be the last time George was seen alive. I wish that I had called somebody. You know, if I had called somebody, then this might not would have happened. His car was found five days later and 12 miles from the market. One witness said she saw the Dodge traveling up the dirt road where it was eventually found with a truck following behind. A short time later, the truck returned along with its unknown driver. There has been no solid evidence on what fate George might have met, but investigators believe he may have been a victim of foul play after leaving the market. Eileen said her husband loved his car and never would have driven it into the woods and left it with the window down and with kindling in the back seat. Another theory holds that he either had a stroke or another medical episode that left him confused and disoriented. He could have parked the car and wandered off into the woods. Investigators have searched Perry and Williamson counties but never found any signs of George. He was declared legally dead in 1993, eight years after his disappearance. Eileen, his wife, would die in 1989, never knowing what happened to her beloved husband, George. As of today, this case remains unsolved. On the night of September 23, 2012, a fire destroyed the home of Bubba and Molly McLaren, killing the couple aged 72 and 70, respectively. Their two grandchildren, Chloe Leverett and Gage Daniel, also lived with them. The only remains found in the house were those of Bubba and Molly, a pet dog, and a pet bird. 
Law enforcement agencies and forensic scientists sifted through the ashes. They found the remains of the grandparents, but no sign of Chloe Leverett or her half-brother, Gage Daniel, who were nine and seven at the time. Some scientists have hypothesized that the heat of the fire could have erased any remains of the children, but their mother, Cheryl Daniel, doesn't believe it. At the time of the fire, the children were living with their grandparents on a farm in Bedford County. Called Buster by the family, Gage was a special needs child. The Tennessee Department of Children's Services said Cheryl Daniel and Gage's father had been investigated between 2006 and 2010, but they wouldn't give any details as to why. It's unclear if the children were living with their grandparents because of the DCS investigations. They were last seen by a neighbor around 6.30 Sunday evening, September 23, 2012. Their Unionville home was engulfed by a fire around 9.30 that same night. According to the TBI, after a five-day search of the site, fire experts were unable to locate evidence that Chloe and Gage were victims of the fire. The site was searched extensively over five days by forensic anthropologists from Middle Tennessee State University, the University of Tennessee, TBI bomb and arson investigators, and experts from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. All they found was one tooth, which could have been from the children or an animal. They feel like they don't have solid evidence right now to assume these children were in the fire. Then TBI spokesperson Kristen Helm told Nashville news station WKRN. That's when the Amber Alert was issued. Cadaver dogs were brought in, infrared cameras were used, and a Tennessee Highway Patrol helicopter flew over the area. But no sign of the children were found. There are no known suspects nor any persons of interest. The TBI continues to follow leads, but there is no indication of where the children could be if they were kidnapped. The internet is flooded with theories as to what happened to the children. The theories range from their small bodies were reduced to ashes to they were kidnapped by an unknown assailant. One thing that continues to fuel the speculation is the unknown cause of the fire. The McLarens were hoarders and Randall Boyce with the Bedford County Sheriff's Office thinks this was why the fire was so hellish. He would describe the house as being very difficult to navigate due to the immense hoarding inside. He also stated Molly was on oxygen, was taking morphine for cancer, and smoked in the bed constantly. Plus, it was a cool night and they had several space heaters through there. Investigators found more than 30 propane tanks in the basement of the home and some of them still contained fuel. While there was evidence the tanks had ruptured, there was no evidence of an explosion. An open door in the basement acted as a draft, sucking air and heat from the fire up to the children's bedroom, directly above Boyce said, according to the Daily Herald. The fire burned so hot, it liquefied metal and took 63 gallons of water to quench it. There was nothing left but ashes. Not even a wall of the home was left standing. There wasn't a piece of that house left, Boyce said in the interview. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. All that was left of that house was a little bit of plastic drip from the vinyl eaves. The rest fell in the basement and burned up. The basement was filled with a pile of ashes four feet deep, Boyce said. Cremations occur at around 1,500 degrees, but fire experts say it is unlikely the house got that hot. Various experts said that it is possible that the children burned to ash in the fire, but teeth are difficult to destroy in a fire. I'm completely confident they weren't in there, said Dr. Mike Tabor, chief odontologist for the medical examiner's office. Tabor studies and identifies teeth, so now we wonder, where are these children? As of today, the children remain missing and the case remains unsolved. Bobby Smelcher was 52 years old when he disappeared from Shelbyville, Tennessee. He had hit some rough patches in life but bounced back and repaired his relationship with his two daughters, Brandy and Jennifer, and his grandchildren. On November 21, 2010, Bobby would go to work, then stop by the grocery store and ate dinner at home. He would then disappear into thin air. Bobby disappeared from his home on East Lane Street in Shelbyville. Investigators found his cell phone, wallet, and keys at his residence, along with a few small blood spots, which police said did not appear to be suspicious. When Bobby didn't go to work on November 22nd, some of his co-workers went to check on him, but no one answered the door. They went back the next day and found the back door wide open and it was pouring down rain. They said they shut the door, locked it up, and left. Afterward, one of his co-workers called Bobby's brother Bryce and said that Bobby was missing and they couldn't find him. Bryce Smelcher went to his brother's home and found drops of blood by the front door and blue jeans in the bathroom that were ripped and appeared to have blood on the front. Later tests would show the blood was Bobby's. Other than finding his cell phone, wallet, and keys, investigators would not find anything out of place. Apparently, the Shelbyville Police Department waited until Monday, November 29th, the day after the Thanksgiving weekend, to process the scene. 
The police found no leads until Bobby's skull was found April 16, 2012, by a fisherman on the Duck River. The fisherman was in an area known to locals as Wolf Meadows, which sits about two miles from Shelbyville. The forensic anthropologists at the University of Tennessee were able to identify the skull as Bobby's with help from dental records. After the identification, searchers and divers combed the Bedford County forest and waterways looking to find more of Bobby but had no luck. Bobby's sister Christy Matheson told the news that more than 300 properties were searched in the years following his death. Because of the lack of additional remains of Bobby, investigators still haven't ruled a cause of death in this case. Officially, investigators have had no leads in tracking down the answer to what happened to Bobby Smelcher. Unofficially, locals believe someone with a score to settle made Bobby disappear, but there is little to back up these rumors. As of today, Bobby's case remains unsolved. On Friday, December 8, 2000, Joshua Lee Walden was at home with his 17-year-old sister, Crystal. Josh was trying to fix his bicycle. At some point during the day, his sister, Crystal, would call out for Josh, but he would not answer. She assumed he had gone to a friend's house to finish fixing the bike. As the day went on, there was still no sign of Josh. His sister would begin to get very worried, and around midnight on December 9th, she would call the police and report Josh missing. A search party would begin looking for Josh through the day, but were unable to locate him. Neighbors have recalled seeing Josh riding his red bicycle through the neighborhood, but thought nothing of it because that was normal. On December 10, 2000, after a day of searching, his brother Jonathan Walden was with friends combing the woods on Missionary Ridge near his family's home in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when they made a horrible discovery. Jonathan would stumble over a small, shoeless human foot sticking out from under some leaves. He refused to look at the face of the body that was hiding under the leaves and would rush back to his father, Johnny Walden, to tell him what he had found. Investigators would block off the area where the body was found to start their investigation. Later that day, they would confirm that the body found was that of Joshua Lee Walden. A forensic examiner was brought in and determined that Josh had died from suffocation, not from strangulation, but from his body being compressed. Someone or something had sit on top of Josh, preventing him from breathing, resulting in his death. Evidence would show that he had not been sexually assaulted, but he had some scratches on the side of his face and nose. The most interesting thing is Josh's feet were both bare. See, Josh had a very interesting quirk. He loved wearing shoes and refused to take them off even when he went to bed. Usually his parents would wait until he was asleep and take them off. Josh would wake up the next morning and be furious at his parents for doing this. Investigators would find no socks or shoes on Josh or near his body. Investigators would keep the worst detail of the murder scene to themselves and would not release the information until over a year later. Whoever killed Josh tried to cover up the evidence by pouring muriatic acid on the body. Muriatic acid, or hydrochloric acid as it's known today, causes very severe burns to the skin. Investigators would say that Josh's killer would have had access to the acid and would not have had to buy it after the murder. Investigators believe Josh's killer was either from the neighborhood or had spent a lot of time there and was very familiar with the area. The killer most likely worked in a job that gave them the access to the muriatic acid. They would also search nationally for other crimes that were similar but found nothing. As the years have gone by, they still have never recovered his socks, shoes, or bicycle. Also, could the killer have known about Josh's strange quirk with shoes and have taken them off as a way of torture? Could neighborhood kids have taken his shoes off to tease Josh and then sit on top of him and accidentally kill him? If that's the case, maybe a family member tried to cover up the scene to protect their child. Interestingly enough, one family would suddenly move out of the neighborhood and out of state after the murder. However, no connection with this has ever been made. We may never know the true answer and as of today, this case remains a mystery. <laughs>